as noted, we kind of held our focus is content marketing with a specialty in SEO. So a lot of our thought process goes around creating what I describe like a single asset on the web and trying to get that to rank for something. So what we do on a constant basis, and I'm sure a lot of you as SEOs and digital marketing practitioners, is analyze the search result and figure out the right recommendation of what that search result needs in order to rank best uh, on that specific search. So every search result, I think, especially in today's world, maybe not as much five years ago, it tells a story. It's a lot going on, uh, sometimes a lot of complexity to it that as an SEO, this is where we add value is kind of getting to know that search result and seeing what's there. Is it news? Is it images? Is it uh, featured snippets? Is there, is there video there? Uh, are you seeing timestamps there? Uh, what kind of title tags are being listed on that specific keyword? All of those things are going to inform your strategy as a whole and what you pick, and at least in my opinion, in order to rank best on that search result. So I think as, from a content strategy point of view, you have to do that SERP analysis and be feel comfortable in doing it in every single search result that exists in order to feel the most confidence that you can rank. So in this presentation, I'm gonna run through several different search results, things you can learn from those, how to analyze them, and kind of the lessons I think you can apply to your day to day. So the first is how to tie a tie. Uh, I don't know how to tie a tie, so I frequently go to this to look and see the different intents someone might have. So there are many different users on, on certain search results that have different intentions. So maybe uh, some people wanna watch a video, some people want illustration, According to Google, some people want that quick answer of how to do that. Uh, also, there's basic text posts as well that form that intent where maybe someone is in some area where they can't play audio and they can't hear that instruction. They might want to get the illustration instead. So there's a lesson there uh, to be had and there's one way of doing it is you can rank on page four and create something that's text-based and has some tie illustrations and yes, you sort of solve for that. But based on this search result, I don't believe you'll win based on that. You have to hit every intent in order to have the highest confidence that you'll show up. Uh, a video is obviously another example as I spoke to. We see that and believe that is an important thing on that search result because Google is showing it as a percentage of that overall. And it's all these kind of like indicators and percentages of that search result that I think inform what we believe we should have on each search result or content asset that we create. And as you can see, both rank. YouTube ranks, we see illustrations from images on the bottom. A uh, basic text post is showing up, or at least is a percentage of that. But if we wanna have confidence, again, I think the blend of those things uh, are necessary. And it's not just necessary, it's those who do this quickly that I believe uh, have the best chance of winning. And I think this matters specifically here because we're also seeing a quick answer. And in general, more and more people, Google wants to surface quick results. So you have to give an answer and do it in a quick fashion. So who does that? That's ties.com. That's the first result. This is kind of the three elements that are present on their page. First, you can't see the play button there, but there's actually a video above the fold. They solve for that even though it's a text link. They solve for that intent of that person. Additionally, they have a very quick text instruction that oftentimes gets pulled in the quick answer, not always. They're also solving with illustration as well because if you're that person who can't play audio, you could just scroll down and hopefully be able to take that intuition from that text. So I believe they rank well here and consistently yes, one, because they're ties.com, but also because they match every single thing that a user might want on this search result. So us as SEOs must have come to bat with all three of these intents in order to have the best confidence that we might rank. So uh, main takeaway there being you need to have content that maps to each element of the search result in, in order to have the highest confidence uh, that you can rank for that said search. Uh, so another example would be flower quotes. Flower quotes is a search, you look at this, on the surface you might think, people just want a text list of flower quotes, maybe a specific additional one or two images that makes it look nice, scannable, things like that. But on quicker or on deeper inference of the search result, we can take some clues based on the structure. So one, we see an image at the top right with a quote on it. Additionally, Google has decided to show images as a second result on that search result. And what that tells me is people are clicking one image tab more often and therefore wanting to get image quote inspiration. Or two, they're clicking this more often and over time it's slowly moved up. Which means to me, users actually want images more often on the search result than not. So if you're not creating those images, you're not gonna have the, the probability of ranking as highly. 
I think as a general equation, the higher priority importance on the search result, I think it's showing, it's Google yelling at us, put more images, put news, make it fresh, make it scannable, because they're, they're saying that users are clicking these things, engaging with these things, and therefore, if you want to be, show up, you have to solve for that intent. And I, you can see also Brainy quote, who's the number one result, you click through, it's not just basic text. They're also showing images for their quotes, shareable things that you can share, and uh, pin and all of those things. So my intuition, my thought process based on this is if you don't create shareable images of things people can pin you're, or share in some way, or even scan and look at, you're going to lose on this search result specifically. And it's just not one or two images, which maybe on the service level you might have thought, but at deeper glance, you actually might need a lot of those in order to compete. Yes, you still need text and copy that's unique in order to rank, but there's something about the search result which if you think about it on a deeper level, maybe it makes more sense. Uh, maybe people searching flower quotes more often might be female, if I'm making that guess. Uh, maybe they share on Pinterest more often. Maybe they want more visual inspiration. As compared to something like motivational quotes, maybe there's more images there. Or business quotes, there might not be as many images. But this specific search gives clues about what people want that not on the surface uh, you might not realize. So my takeaway based on this an an analysis is look at the proximity to the top of the page on a search result to inform uh, what should be included and also what needs to be great in order to get those rankings sustainably. Best headphones is another interesting search result. Uh, news results, we also see timestamps littered all across us. Makes sense, it's technology, there's dates. People want the newest and best headphones that exist when they do a search like this. Uh, but what I think is interesting about this is not just the idea of freshness, because I think in the SEO world people say freshness all the time. I think it's the degree of freshness which is interesting and can be analyzed on the search result, which then informs our content strategy. So I think when you look at this, you see the news, but also you see literally the results on this page have been updated in the last month when I took the screenshot. There's fresh results that are a lot of dates that are maybe within the last year, but this takes it up another notch in showing the last month. So in my opinion, in order to compete here, you have to either update or QA and update your timestamps at least once a month in order to compete on this search result. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to update the whole thing, uh, but you need to be constantly at least looking at it, making sure the products aren't outdated, maybe there's a new product out there. Because if you're a user, the reason this is happening is because people want the newest, best headphones, and also they're not clicking things that are older than a month because this is so quickly changing that people want the things that are less than a month. So even if you're still a good result for best headphones that's over 30 days old, you're gonna get less clicks. And if we believe that Google uses that as an engagement signal, that's gonna move you down uh, overall. So my strategy based on looking at this analysis would be to look at the, the top 30 and create a strategy to update the timestamp once a month. Maybe you completely update the entire post once every six months or even quarter, obviously, if a new product comes out, it makes sense to include that. But that's how I would interpret the search result based on the kind of queries that are there. And the other thing that I think is interesting on this search result specifically is you can't rank as a first party here very reliably. Reliably, Best type searches tend to be curative. Users want an uh, authoritative source, generally a publisher who gives that opinion. It cut, people come to us a lot that are first parties and they say, we wanna rank for best shampoo, and they offer shampoo, and I say, you can't rank for that. You can create a product that's so great and we can work with you to work with the publishers to get on these posts, but you can't directly rank there just because that's the nature of that semantic fit, what users want, they want the curative result from that. And there are exceptions, you might see one person there, even Best Buy is not truly a publisher, I believe they have some benefit because the URL is best and it has that and that's gonna help them. But overall, I think nine out of 10 times, you're not gonna get on this unless you're a publisher. So you should probably find an alternative strategy to show up there and lean on publishers in some way as a first party in order to get those rankings. So the takeaway there, use the timestamp trends on the search results to inform your update strategy and you must be updating post states in some way, especially if you're on these competitive search results in order to compete. Uh, another interesting one is how to fly a kite. So we looked at how to tie a tie before, kind of similar, people want video, they want text. Uh, there's some brands on the search result, there's some people also ask. 
I think what's interesting on this one is there's a brand National Kite Month, which shows up here, it ranks number one actually. And in the user's perception, even though they're not a real brand, I think this is a non-competitive search result, people might click that more often. It feels like a organization, it feels like a nonprofit in some way. People probably will click that. The problem is this is not good content. This is hard to scan, looks poor, they sort of get the quick answer. That's not an optimal quick answer in my opinion at, at all. That said, they win. And the problem is brands can break the search results and rank sometimes and alternatively kind of nudge their way up on some things like this, especially on less competitive search results. That doesn't mean we should rely on that as SEOs. We should instead, I think, map to all these strategies in a, as a whole in order to best rank and also just know that you shouldn't use National Kite Month to inform your content strategy because this is a bad post. It's hard, not good visuals, no video, et cetera, et cetera. So as an SEO, I think it, especially one who wants to be great or a digital marker or however you define yourself, you shouldn't leverage that, but you should be aware of obviously the brand advantage people have uh, in their search results. Marketing automation, pulling it back to B2B, another interesting one. I think this one is interesting. It's two to three word term, two to two word term obviously. But you see a lot of definitional type searches. What is marketing automation? Wikipedia is functionally definitional. People also ask is a lot of definitions. And at the end, we see some tools kind of sprinkled in there as well. Uh, and you get further down, you get even more. It actually ramps up. But at the top, there's clearly a want to or a users are clicking tools or definitions more often. So what I think is interesting is the general framework this search has. It's a jargon term is how I would describe it a two to three word jargon term. So what I would mean by that is like industry specific, the average person doesn't know what that is. I think most of these search results will have this exact framework where it's a what is type search when you remove the what is part of it. Most of the time there will be search volume for what is, but if you remove that, you'll also get, uh, you'll be able to rank for this by creating a what is type definitional search experience. Because I think a lot of people are just like, what is, it's another way of saying what is without saying what it is, is bringing in the short tail version of that. So you can map this to whatever two to three word jargon term space you want to rank for. Obviously these are highly valuable terms a lot of the time and they all sort of look like this in some way. Another thing that's interesting is that sometimes you might not want to call your post what is inbound marketing, what is SEO. That's not always super linkable or shareable. There's other ways of doing it. For example, Moz specifically, they have the Beginner's Guide to SEO, which maybe a lot of you have seen. They rank for SEO. That is a one word jargon term in this case, but it's still very definitional in its nature. If I was building that guide and I decided that I wanted to structure it that way, not call it what is SEO guide, that's not as exciting or shareable. What you could do there is create an H1 very high on that post and have that be, or H2 rather, defining that definition because you're matching to that user intent of the two to three word jargon term where they want to find this information near the top. They are coming to these searches to find that definition. Even if you don't call the post that, you have to solve for that intent high up or you're not going to be able to rank. And similarly, the next piece of this is solving for the quick answer. So a framework I've thought about and it's just if you think about quick answers in general, is the idea of what would a robot or a spider extract from a page confidently and know that that's a quick answer. In this case, I believe a definition is what is X is keyword here and then the first sentence needs to be X is blank. A lot of people make the mistake of making X is blank some kind of like fluff story or something like that. And you can imagine if you're a spider or a robot crawling the web, would you be confident and be able to pull out two to three sentences about this in the quick answer that would confidently be a definition. The more reliably you are, the more reliably close you are to that H2, to that, that statement, what is inbound marketing, a definition is right about to come after this, and then you lead with the framework that a normal definition would have, the more likely it is they would return that in the quick answer. Obviously you don't always see this, you're gonna see some broken disconnects of how Google shows this in quick answers, but my recommendation for most definition type queries is either call the post this and lead with keyword is blank or then do an overarching guide, start with an H2 that says this and then say keyword is blank. And you'll get pulled into the quick answer a good percentage of the time. I can't guarantee you're gonna win, but that makes a lot of sense intuitively to me and we've seen success in doing that. 
Uh, so in addition, on this search specifically, we saw those tools. So a natural framework here would be define what is in marketing automation. You could have that post. And for the beginner, you could then sequence into a list of tools that they should start looking about, looking at, thinking about, and uh, thinking about including on their posts. But if I was building this as someone who had the authority to rank, I'd probably call it what is marketing automation, and then maybe say over, re, overview and tools as a title or something like that. So you're matching both intents. People might click you in both intents. That's going to help your click-through rate, your engagement, et cetera. And overall, hopefully, best map to every single searcher, which in turn should help you use your engagement signals. So long story short, two to three word jargon terms. Sometimes one, it doesn't have to be two to three, actually, now that I think about this. But normally, it's one to three in some way. It's like kind of complex term. Uh, they use what I would use what is as a primary element. And then right after that, create an X is framework instead of going into some story or fluff. Make it very direct. Punch them in the face with that definition, and you're more likely to actually get that quick answer. Uh, it's unfortunate you have to do it that way, but it's just kind of the nature of the beast uh, with these search results. Living room ideas, going back to B2C, a lot of image results, inspiration, quick answer. Again, people trying to get quick ideas, even though I don't think that's a great result, in my opinion. You see also the list numbers on these results. Uh, high numbers. I think in inspiration type searches, you're going to want to aim to get the best uh, amount of listings, that can be difficult sometimes, but it, maybe it's 50 ideas in this case, which would do two things. One, if I'm a user wanting inspiration, I might want to click that more often. Second, the content depth will keep them on site longer than these other sites will, based on an engagement kind of metric. Like if I'm, I would think our content will be longer, more engaging, et cetera, because it's 50. Also, I might click this because it's 50, all those things in total. Pretty simple one, but it's kind of one we use as a, a rubric, is in inspiration type searches, look for the best in class title plus content combination in order to rank consistently well. But on the converse side of that is a search like email marketing tools. And this one is a little bit different in that you, if you guys have heard of the skyscraper technique, which is to make the best thing on the search result, make it so much better than everything else. And some people might go the, the route of building 300 tools that you should check out for email marketing. I think that's a misapplication of the rule because sometimes you can't actually add value past the 22. I do think an inspiration is possible, but here you can think about like even SEO tools. If you there's probably a core seven to ten that you would probably tell that first person that starts at your company, and then the next 40 tools are less valuable, less useful. And I think that f finds its way into the search result and that users are more likely to click things that have a limited number of searches or a limited number of tools because they want that quick, punchy, give me the 10 tools I really need today, not the 100 tools just because uh, I read that on uh, Brian Dean's blog that I need to create a skyscraper and what have you. Uh, so that's where I think this search result differs. And in most software spaces, it's more of a limited curation where you want a small number of tools, really punch it home, show your authority of why they should believe you when they give you those 10 to 15 tools. And yes, there are exceptions to these kind of things where there are big, massive posts that rank. I think that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best user experience. It might be some combination of domain authority or something else. Uh, Brian Dean specifically actually did put a post that has like 200 tools, but he also gives you some filter options to like Brian's picks at the end of the day. So there's that combination. And I think if you're really trying to rank for this, you need high domain authority. And a limited number is actually what people want from these results. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's kind of the nature of the beast on these results. But you can see how that counters against what we just said. Uh, we saw the UX difference of the tools. And then the living room ideas had very high numbers. And if you compare these two search results, I think the mental signifier we can use here is actually the images up here. Left means visual inspiration. Right is just more curative small lists. Because if I'm, there's no definitive answer for most ideas terms. It's inspiration. It's a multiple uh, different options available to people. With software, it's a little more limited. Obviously, there's some personal opinion. But with inspiration, you hypothetically can go for a while in terms of the number of things you can do. And I think the images show there is no absolute right answer for every person for living room ideas. Therefore, more results on average make sense. And people might click that more often because of that. But this email marketing tool side does not have any like 
thing to click, or is no visual images that Google is showing us there. Obviously, it's software, so it's a little obvious on that side. But you see how the constructs of these two search results inform also our strategy for titles uh, and the content as well. So long story short, on that one, know when to shoot for the highest number, know when not to, know when to bring it home with a shorter piece of content, because that's really what makes sense for that asset. And quick answers specifically, uh, and taking away from the specific search results, I think there are also interesting things there we can learn as well. I have this specific theory, and this is where I, it goes back to, I can't really guarantee that you can get a quick, quick answer, is I think they're actually A-B testing search results. It makes sense to me because if I'm Google, I want to make more money from ads, I'm going to A-B test the things most least likely to make me click something. Actually, that, sorry, that right one is a mistake screenshot. But if you uh, focus on the left, basically, the idea is that they might want to show quick answers that makes you click ads more often or m do more searches more often because the more searches you do on average, the more likely you're going to click an ad. The whole reason they do quick answers is so you do more searches. Yes, it's good for users as well, but you might do more searches, which in turn click more ads. And here specifically, I was thinking about this, and I was like, if I was Google and we saw who was advertising on that top result, you, you're kind of at the whim of who's bidding up there as a quick answer if they're trying to show the thing least likely to drive a click. Because if you're mapping to something that's in that ad section, you're probably more likely to not drive a click, which is actually what they want. Because you, if you're saying Bose is the best headphones, the Bose 35 are the best headphones in that quick answer, you're authoritative in some way to a user, you're Forbes, and then you see the quick answer shopping result, I bet for a percentage of people, they're just gonna click that ad and they're never gonna click your site. So I have the feeling that there's some benefit to kind of aligning to who is in the, the ad section. Because if your quick answer in some way aligns and still quick, it is a quick answer to whatever that thing is, there's probably a higher percentage chance you're gonna drive less clicks, but maybe more likely stick there so hopefully be a benefit to your business, which in turn would get you to stick there. So if Google's A-B testing these search results, if that's accurate and you're seeing the people that are bidding there and your quick answers show what's bidding there, you're less likely to click it. Therefore, they might have you stick there, which is a bummer overall. We're trying to solve for less clicks, but it's the reality that they're gonna do that, so we have to play with what we're, we're given, and I believe that makes sense on that search result that if we think about what's, what's there, you can potentially inform an even better optimized QA to get more stickiness there uh, Unfortunately, just because that's the way Google is playing the game today. And of course, this is just a theory. Uh, I mean, you guys have probably seen the quick answers getting rotated in and out. It makes sense to me that even if you're following a good process, someone else does something new, they want to do that test to see if it drops clicks on average. Therefore, these kinds of things could be in play is if you're up against someone who's bidding a lot up top, and not every search result is going to be the same, could be more possible that you could do something smart there to make sure you stick as a quick answer. Waffle Recipes takes it to another level. It's actually what I would describe as a quick meta description. Uh, here, they, they have a quick answer already. I didn't show a screen, screenshot of that. But you can see they're actually doing the same thing they actually pull into most quick answers, is they'll, they'll take the steps of how to create waffles and put it there. And they do this a lot on search results like this, and you'll see it because most of the meta descriptions get extended in some way. They're higher, they're trying to answer how to cook waffles without having to ever click something. It's a bummer for us, but it gives you better click-through rate to solve for that. And also, uh, it's just the name of the game, and uh, hopefully most people can't cook waffles without actually clicking something, or at least well. So in general, it's something to look for is Google solving for the quick answer and the quick meta description. I think a lot of people don't realize why, when Go these are changing, Right now, I believe like 70, 80% of the time, and it might even be stronger than that, to be honest, that when they're pulling in something else, they're trying to give the user a quick answer in a different location. So they're trying to double up on that quick answer experience in order to drive less clicks so they can get more ad clicks. I do believe as a user, as someone who's structuring the content, that makes sense to do and will also inform what users want also. They'll move content up. These are ranking extremely high. When you go lower on the search result, you see that third place not using the quick meta description, but the one through four at the time of the search, we're all using quick meta descriptions, possibly because this result 
did not have that structure in order to get that pulled into that. And that might be partially informing why there is no quick meta description uh, or why that one is ranking worse because it's uh, not as optimal of an experience for users. So uh, yeah, if you aren't structured quick on search results that are pulling in things like this, I think it's less likely you'll actually be able to rank well and rank effectively over time. And of course, you might not get the quick answer either. But sometimes you're actually fighting for a quick meta description as well. And that's another way to kind of level up your thought process about how to get more clicks, better rankings, and et cetera, even if you don't get the quick answer. It's not just for quick answers. These can actually get you better click-through rate because your meta description will be taller. You'll have more real estate on the search result. And also, I believe, give users something they'll actually stick on for a second and hopefully then click and go uh, make those waffles. <laughs> so uh, obviously, these are just like a lot of different micro examples that I went through. There's a lot of search results out there all with their own story and telling you how to think about formulating a content asset. Uh, they're all different. They all have news, images, blah, blah, blah. You have to use each element of that to inform what your content should look like, what your page should be structured as, and I think that will better inform uh, the rankings. And if you just go very basic and you just make the flower quotes with a lot of flower quotes and one image at the top that looks kind of nice, I don't think you're going to reward uh, rank consistently and overall uh, will be behind all the people on page 100, maybe not there, but uh, not doing well overall. So hopefully this was useful. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.